Spear of Destiny. The Nazi Party has long been associated with the looting and hoarding of historical artifacts, pseudoscientific research, and the occult. This was especially true of Heinrich Himmler and his SS. Himmler, who had a personal occultist, created a chapter of his elite SS known as the Annen Erbe as a form of think tank and research unit. The Annen Erbe was devoted to promoting the Nazi Party ideals regarding Aryan superiority and carrying out research into the occult. One objective of the Annen Erbe was to unearth or establish a strong historical identity of the Nazis' Aryan predecessors through the study of archaeology. Hitler wanted to demonstrate the superiority of the Aryan race, and he believed the Nazis could use any clues of an Aryan past in propaganda to justify the German settlement of captured territory. One of the most precious artifacts sought by the Nazis was the Spear of Destiny, also known as the Holy Lance or the Lance of Longinus, which is alleged to be the spear that pierced Christ's abdomen while he hung from the cross. The Bible even alludes to this infamous weapon, stating that, although Christ was already dead upon the cross, quote, one of the soldiers with spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. As a child, Hitler had seen the spear in a museum, and he had become enamored with it, believing it to be a key to untold power. He's supposed to have later stated that the Spear of Destiny had given him a vision of the future, which had informed his own political and ideological beliefs. One reason that high-ranking Nazis were willing to chase this artifact, besides its cultural significance, was that the Spear of Destiny is said to bestow upon its possessor magical powers, including immortality and the ability to conquer one's enemies. Legend has it that the first Roman Emperor, Charlemagne, had wielded the Spear of Destiny for 47 consecutive military victories, and that on the very day he finally dropped it, he fell dead. Hitler and his officers believed that the Spear would aid them in the same way as they waged war in Europe. As part of the imperial regalia of the Holy Roman Emperor, Hitler also believed that possessing the Spear would legitimize his right to rule in victory. In October 1938, under orders from Hitler, the spear was taken by train to Nuremberg, where dedicated members of the SS carefully guarded it at St. Catherine's Church. The Spear of Destiny remained under lock and key, in possession of the Nazi party as it fought its sinister campaign, until the 30th of April 1945. It was liberated by U.S. forces just two hours before Hitler's death, ultimately repeating the prophecy originally fulfilled by Charlemagne almost 2,000 years prior. Mjolnir in addition to pursuing Christian artifacts, the Nazis were interested in Norse and Scandinavian pieces. Heinrich Himmler held this interest in exceptionally high importance, believing that mystical objects of Scandinavian origin could hold immense power. The most famous of these artifacts is commonly known as Thor's hammer, or Mjolnir. Thor, the god of thunder in Norse mythology, wielded his hammer to devastating effect as a physical weapon, but it's also believed to provide divine blessings. It's been alluded to in numerous historical texts and held particularly high symbolic value to the Vikings. Many artifacts have been created that evoke Thor's hammer and claim to be the legitimate article. Himmler, who became obsessed with discovering Mjolnir, wrote a letter to the Annen Erbe in May 1940, requesting that they, quote, find all places in the northern Germanic Aryan cultural world where an understanding of the lightning bolt, the thunderbolt, Thor's hammer, or the flying or throne hammer exists. Insisting that his Annen Erbe soldiers and researchers gather all relevant historical materials, Himmler's letter also confessed that he was, quote, convinced that this is not based on natural thunder and lightning, but rather that it is an early, highly developed form of war weapon of our forefathers, and that it implies an unheard of knowledge of electricity. In the hands of the Third Reich, Himmler believed that Mjolnir's immense power could be used to further their political and military agenda. Under Himmler's orders, the Annen Erbe searched for Mjolnir and hoarded scores of related statues, amulets, and texts, but never found the hammer itself. Regardless, modern-day neo-Nazis still employ the image of Mjolnir as a symbol of power. Henry the Fowler's Skeleton In addition to pursuing sacred treasures and artifacts, the SS sought more macabre artifacts. Henry the Fowler, a 10th-century king of East Francia, was so called because he was said to have been working on his bird-catching nets when a messenger arrived to inform him that he was to be king. Henry the Fowler gained legendary status by waging a successful campaign against numerous Eastern European rivals and by creating the first unified German state. He was immensely popular with his subjects in life and with various artists since. Upon his death in the year 936, King Henry the Fowler's widow, Queen Matilda, founded an abbey adjacent to his castle in what is now known as Kvedlinburg, complete with a dark stone crypt in which to bury the king. 
Henry became the subject of plays, operas, and paintings in the centuries following his demise. He came prominently to the public's attention in 1936, when Heinrich Himmler gained an interest and directed his SS towards the king's burial place. Inspired by the fact that King Henry the Fowler was considered by many to be the first king of Germany, Himmler appeared to believe that he himself was a reincarnation of Henry. On July 2, 1936, exactly 1,000 years after the king's death, Himmler traveled to Kvitlinburg for what would be the first of several visits. In the crypt where Henry the Fowler's remains lay, Himmler held a candlelit ceremony. Himmler professed to be a direct descendant of the first German king, with whom he shared a name. He then declared that Henry's resting place was a place of pilgrimage for true Germans. It later came out, in previously classified communications, that Himmler believed the legacy of Henry the Fowler to be a great propaganda opportunity. One of these letters, from the head of the SS to Himmler, stated that, quote, The thousand-year anniversary within the coming year is, from a propaganda standpoint, virtually a godsend for us. Identifying numerous parallels between the King's narrative and those of the Nazi party, Himmler sought to exploit these similarities to build support and establish a firm historical underpinning for the Aryan line. Himmler even used the King's records to attempt to justify episodes of genocide committed by the SS, saying of King Henry that he, quote, had the courage to create unpopular politics and had the wherewithal and the power to see them through. During one grand ceremony at the Abbey, attended by many officials and Nazi officers, it was discovered and publicly revealed, to the great embarrassment of Himmler, that the king's remains were not in the crypt. While Queen Matilda's body remained untouched, Henry the Fowler had been removed. Himmler gave his SS troops the task of finding the missing body, and they set about excavating local cemeteries. As another great ceremony approached in 1937, the SS miraculously or perhaps conveniently, seemed to find the royal corpse. The reinternment ceremony devised by Himmler involved midnight rituals and dramatic organ music. He declared that the king had been returned to his rightful resting place. As the Second World War drew to an end, U.S. troops closed in on Kvedlinburg. At this point in time, several priceless artifacts were stolen from the local church. These items included jewel-encrusted tomes, ancient manuscripts, and unique relics. It was not until near the end of the 20th century that these items began to resurface, and investigations made by a New York Times journalist traced the theft back to American Army Lieutenant Joe Tom Medor, whose heirs ultimately returned the priceless artifacts to their rightful place, where they remain today. As for the remains of Henry the Fowler, their true location is still unconfirmed. Bohuslan Petroglyphs much of the Nazi's pseudo-archaeology sought to establish that the Aryan race had existed for millennia and been responsible for many of the ancient world's greatest accomplishments. The intention was that this would support the propaganda claiming Aryan superiority. When Himmler was presented with a slideshow by the head of his Ananerba that appeared to depict an ancient Aryan language in the form of 12,000-year-old petroglyphs, Himmler ordered an expedition. If this proved true, it would be evidence of a writing system that predated all other known ones. The Ananerba analyzed the petroglyphs found on the Swedish island of Bohuslan, and plaster casts were made to preserve their likeness. These could then be transported back to Germany. The process of making the casts was performed poorly, causing irreparable damage to the ancient carvings. The expedition lasted for three months and was unsuccessful in proving anything meaningful. It was carried out by ill-informed individuals who prioritized personal beliefs over sound scientific methodologies. Despite the many attempts to persuade the people of Sweden that they were part of Hitler's master race, these ideas were largely dismissed. After the war, Hermann Wirth, the man who had initially proposed the expedition, was permitted to carry on working on the petroglyphs in Sweden. However, the government ultimately banned him from the location for his incompetent work and the accidental alterations he had made to the ancient site. Bio-Tapestry Perhaps one of the best-known artifacts ever sought by the Nazis is the Bayeux Tapestry, a 70-meter-long embroidered cloth that depicts the Norman conquest of England in 1066 and the famous Battle of Hastings. The Ananerba sought to establish that the tapestry had been made by Aryan hands, believing, or at least claiming, that its beauty and intricacy must have been the product of a superior race. Himmler was so taken by the tapestry that he had already allocated a place for it to hang in his private medieval castle. In 1939, as Nazi forces approached France, special measures were taken to protect the tapestry from the invaders, along with various other museum collections. 
This secure location was an underground shelter where it remained safely for two years. When the Nazis invaded France, the Ananerba sought to secure the tapestry, finally getting their hands on it in June 1944 and escorting it to the Louvre. On August 18th, as German forces prepared to withdraw from France, Himmler sent a message which ordered the tapestry to be sent back to Germany to be kept, quote, in a place of safety. However, this message was intercepted by Bletchley Park, which by then had cracked the infamous Enigma Code. By the time the SS came to retrieve the tapestry, the Louvre had fallen back under French control, and the Allied forces secured its safekeeping. It was then displayed at the Louvre for the first time in over a century. The exhibition was a moment of French national pride, coinciding with a visit from Winston Churchill to celebrate the Allied victory. Within months, the Bayeux tapestry was back in Bayeux and on public display. Are you ready to unlock the secrets of the past? Subscribe now to Dark Five's brand new Ancient Mysteries channel and embark on a journey to uncover the most enigmatic and awe-inspiring mysteries of ancient times. Leave a comment if there are any ancient mysteries you want us to explore in upcoming videos.